This is a Porsche 918 Spider. Of course, you already knew that because the 918 Spider is one of the most exciting, thrilling, and widely covered cars manufactured in the last 25 years. When these things were new, they sold for just a hair over $1 million. And today, the average asking price for a 918 Spider on Auto Trader is $1.7 million for a car. Today, I traveled to Nashville, Tennessee, and I borrowed this 918 from a viewer who's on Instagram as Mazer327. You can follow him if you click the link in the description below. And you should follow him because, I mean, the guy's got a 918 Spider and a 911R. Do you really need any more reason? Anyway, today I'm going to find out what you get when you pay $1.7 million for a car. To start, a little background in case you don't know much about the 918 Spider. This is Porsche's third supercar in the modern era, after the 959 in the 1980s and the Carrera GT in the mid-2000s. When this car was new two years ago, the base price was around $860,000, but options could easily push that price over a million dollars. Now, that's insane money, but this is an insane car. Back here it has a gas-powered V8 with over 600 horsepower, and it also has two electric motors with almost 300 horsepower. The combined total is 887 horsepower, and you can drive it on purely electric power if you want, and it'll do 0 to 60 in 2.4 seconds, and it'll do 211 miles an hour, making it the fastest car I've ever reviewed, or driven, or sat in. So today I'm going to show you around the 918 Spider and I'm going to show you all of its cool quirks and its weird features and then I'm going to get it out on the road and find out what it's like to drive the ultimate Porsche, maybe the ultimate German car of all time. And of course for more of my thoughts on the 918 Spider and the experience of driving a car this valuable, click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer where I've also got a list of other modern cars currently listed for sale on Autotrader that have appreciated in value. I'll start by simply getting inside the 918, which is more interesting than you might think. Now, for one, the 918's key is just the regular standard Porsche key fob, the same key you'd get if you bought a base Cayenne for $49,995. Now, to get inside, it's pretty simple. You press the unlock button, and then you reach into this little cubby where you find the door handle, and you open the door right up. But what happens if the battery's dead and the electronics are gone? There's no exterior keyhole. Well, actually there is. It's inside the little door handle cubby. You take the key out of the little Porsche key fob, which interestingly you can't do if it's on a key ring, and then you stick it inside the carefully hidden exterior keyhole in order to open your 918 Spider if the battery is dead. Now that we're inside the car, we start with the steering wheel. Now the steering wheel isn't that unusual for a Porsche. It has the Porsche logo in the middle of it, three spokes. It seems like a fairly normal steering wheel but there are a few quirks. On the left side, you will find three buttons. The top button is for cruise control, on and off. There is actually a little hidden button for some more adjustments on the side. Below it is a button marked M. That's for manual mode. If you want the transmission to go into manual mode, you push the little M button, and then you can use the panels to shift, and it won't shift for you. Below that is a little button with a diamond on it. You may be wondering, what is that thing? The HOV lane button? No, it's called the Joker button, and you can program it to do anything you want inside the car's central infotainment screen. That's right, Porsche calls it the Joker button. It's one of the strangest names I've ever heard given to an interior car control. On the right side of the steering wheel, you'll find the other cool quirk, which is a little wheel with a red button inside it. The wheel is labeled E, H, S, and R, which stands for Electric, Hybrid, Sport, and Racing. It's different drive modes for the car, and yes, electric lets you drive it in fully electric mode with no gasoline engine at all. But the really cool thing is that little red button inside that wheel. It's called Hot Lap Mode. You press it, and you get a little extra juice from the electric motors for one hot lap or for one fast pass on the highway or on a racetrack. Next, since we're talking drive modes, we better talk transmission selector, which is one of the strangest I've seen. It's mounted to the right of the steering wheel, where you would find the ignition in a normal car, and it's just this tiny little lever. It goes between R at the top, N in the middle for neutral, and D at the bottom for drive. When you want to park the car, simply put it in neutral, and then press the parking brake, and you're parked. Interestingly, this car doesn't have a push-button starter like everything else, including Hyundai's. It has a normal key you have to stick in the slot on the left, like all the other Porsches. And since we're talking strange buttons and switches, we have to move on to the center controls. Now, the center controls in this car have the same font as the buttons in regular Porsche models, but in this car, they're not buttons. They're all touchscreeny. When the car is off, you can't see them. It's just one black panel. But when you turn it on, all the buttons 
come to life. Now, the most interesting one of all is the climate controls. This car has dual zone automatic climate controls, but it only has one dial for you to adjust the temperature. So how does it work? Well, you push the dial and then the thing that you're adjusting lights up inside the climate control to let you know what you're changing. Push the dial again, the other one lights up. Push the dial again, the other one lights up, and you can change it as you push the dial. That isn't the most intuitive solution I've ever seen, but it does clean up the center controls and ensure that it isn't full of fussy switches and dials and buttons like in some other cars. And since I'm talking about the climate controls, I might as well address another one of the interior's strangest things. That would be the climate control vents. Now, like most cars, there is a climate control vent to the left of the steering wheel for the driver and a climate control vent on the far right for the passenger. That's normal. But because of this giant center control stack, where do you put the climate control vent in the middle? Well, it's hidden. It's at the very top of the dashboard, one tiny little vent, only an inch high. But because this is a pretty small cabin, that actually works pretty well, although it's worth noting you can't direct the air and send it onto you or onto your passenger. It chooses where to go instead. And since I'm talking about the functionality of the center controls, it's worth mentioning that with a little slide of your finger above the center controls, you can adjust the little screen that's at the top of the dashboard. You can look at, for instance, the map, you can look at the radio, the current time, and the car status. You can also make the screen smaller or larger, and you can adjust its position, although as you can see here, it isn't quite the easiest thing to do. These touchscreen things have improved a lot even since 2015. More interesting controls, something else I like is that the little buttons on the top of the center control stack pull up a picture of the car showing exactly what they're doing when you push them. For example, if you push the little button for the suspension mode, it shows the suspension getting sportier or less sporty in the center screen. And speaking of that center screen, it's worth noting that this car has not one, not two, but four info screens that you can adjust and look at in order to see various different things. There are two in the gauge cluster. One is over on the left, and it's controlled by a little button on the left of the steering wheel. The other is on the right, controlled by a button on the right of the steering wheel. The other is the one in the middle I just showed you, and the fourth is the one at the top of the center control stack. My favorite of these screens is the one to the left of the gauge cluster. Apparently they had a big contract with the screen company, but they had run out of stuff to actually put in these screens. So in that one, you can choose between two things. One is you can set a speed limit so you don't accidentally violate the speed limit if you're driving near with a lot of police. The other is it just displays what number 918 Spider you have. That's good info when you're driving down the road. And by the way, the screen at the top of the center controls does exactly what you think. It's a touch screen and it displays for you the radio station, for example, and allows you to change. It displays all sorts of vehicle functions like interior lighting and exterior lighting and the sounds the car makes and that little joker key that I talked about before on the steering wheel. It shows you a map of the navigation system of where you are and all sorts of other vehicle functions that you'd expect from a center touchscreen. And next up, let's talk cup holder. Yes, this car has a cup holder. It sticks out of the center control stack and it's actually pretty sturdy and it can hold a reasonable size drink. The interesting thing about this cup holder is it's detachable. If you don't want it there, you can get rid of it, although it doesn't fold up and instead you just cast it aside and then you can use it to hold drinks, I don't know, in your house. <laughs> you have a little storage area inside. It's the center console box, and it is just about the tiniest storage area I've ever seen inside any car. I don't even know why they bothered. Now, the other interesting center console area is this one in here in the middle. It's completely open underneath this center control stack. You can reach over and touch your driver or passenger's legs, depending on where you're sitting. It's kind of an interesting feature. You can't put anything in there. It's just open so you can see through it. Next up, because of this car's electric powertrain, you don't just have a tachometer and a fuel gauge like you do in every other car. You have a battery life gauge that tells you how much battery is left. That is pretty obvious. My favorite additional gauge is there's a little gauge that shows you how hard the electric motors are working. So when you floor it, the tachometer shoots up and so does the electric power gauge. It's kind of cool to watch. There's also in the middle of the gauge cluster, a little charge display. This car can recharge itself as it drives using braking and the engine. And so when you're recharging the little charge icons light up to show that you're recharging the batteries. It's a brave new world when a supercar has all that. Now, it's worth noting that the production number of your 918 Spider doesn't just appear in that little screen inside the gauge cluster. It also appears inside the car in the driver's footwell on the center tunnel and in the center tunnel on the passenger footwell. So you'll never forget exactly what number 918 you have. It also appears back here on your hood. Yes, that's right. This is your hood. You see all this back here? 
it doesn't open. You can't open it. If you want to go and actually look at the engine in your 918 Spider, you got to take it to the dealer and they can open it. And instead, this is the only panel that opens. To open it, you push a little button on the driver's side door and it unlatches so you can add fluids like engine oil. But that's it. That's all you get. You pay $1.7 million for a car, you can't even look at your own engine. Although, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we don't need people poking around inside the engine of a 918 Spider. Naturally, that isn't even close to the 918 Spider's only exterior quirk. Here's another one. You see these things right here? This is the engine exhaust. That's right. There's no exhaust pipe, tailpipe, coming out of the car underneath the bumper like in every other car. The exhaust comes out of here right behind where you're sitting. The benefit of this is obvious. You get to hear the engine a lot better than you would when you floor it if the exhaust were under the bumper. Another interesting exterior quirk of the 918 Spider. how about this? This is the entire rear window. This is all you get to see behind you aside from the mirrors, your only window out the back. It's so small, it's about the size of an iPad. I can block the entire thing with my hand. Not that I need to do that because the rear spoiler does a pretty good job of blocking it. Yes, that's right, the rear spoiler. It is massive. And the interesting things about the spoiler are twofold. One is that it contains the third brake light for the car, which means the third brake light goes up and down depending on the position of the spoiler. And that is the other interesting thing, the spoiler is adjustable. Not with a button inside the car, but instead you have to go to the rear spoiler menu and just hold down the touchscreen. So here's what happens, you push it down and Spoiler goes up and down, up and down. The owner of this car likes to keep the spoiler in the up position because he thinks it looks best that way, and personally, I very much agree with him. Another interesting rear quirk, how about the fact that the reversing light is all the way down here, basically at the bottom of the car, below the license plate. It's almost like it was an afterthought, but it isn't the lowest thing on the rear of the car. That honor goes to the reversing camera, which is only mounted a couple of inches above the ground. Now, moving on to the side of the 918 for some more exterior quirks, starting with the fuel door. Now, on the driver's side, it's the fuel door, and on the passenger side, it's the door for the charge port. Now, the charge port door, you can just walk right up to it and open it. And if you do, you'll notice that the door is carbon fiber. On the driver's side, the fuel door cannot be opened unless you press a little button on the driver's side door. Once you open it, it's capless. Just stick the fuel pump right in and start pumping away into your 918 Spider. Another interesting item on the side of the 918, how about the fact that it's dirty. When this car came to me this morning, it was completely clean. I drove around for a little bit and look at all the road grime and rocks and debris and leaves that have already accumulated. The owner says this happens every single time he drives it and he says that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is this intake back here, which often gets rocks kicked up from the road and from the front tire, and getting those is a lot more difficult than getting to the ones right behind the front wheel. I could see that being an issue if you wanted to keep your 918 Spider clean. On the subject of the wheels, the 918 Spider has center lock wheels, which can be changed out quicker on a racetrack instead of a wheel that has five lug nuts. It's getting pretty common on sports cars. What's less common is the fact that the 918 Spider has different colored center locks on different sides. The driver's side is red, the passenger side is blue. This is a throwback to the Carrera GT, but also a throwback to other race cars that have different colored center locks so people in the pit lanes at racetracks know which wheels go on which side of the car without having to really look at. But that isn't my favorite thing about the wheels. My favorite thing about the wheels is inside them. Look at that brake caliper. You notice how it's green, tennis ball green? Well, Porsche calls that color acid green, and it was the 918's color, if you will. I say that because if you look closely, it appears in a lot more places all around the 918. Next up, the 918 Spider is a very low sports car, so it doesn't always clear every speed bump or road obstacle. Now, Porsche knows that, so they fitted it with an axle lifter system. Push a little button inside the cabin, and the car raises up to clear bumps and other obstacles. Now, that isn't that uncommon. A lot of modern sports cars have that now, but it's rare that you find one that works this quickly. Take a look. I'm pushing the button now. And we're already up. That's really cool. In other words, if you're approaching something, you push the button and then boom, you get up really quickly. The weird thing is after it lifts, this noise happens for a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Next up, how about the fact that the 918 Spider has a mono wiper, one single windshield wiper for the whole windshield? I didn't know that. I hadn't noticed that detail in 918 Spider before, and I was surprised to see it. I drove the car around earlier today in the rain a little bit, and I was also surprised at just how well it works. It's quick, and it covers the entire windshield. And then there's the roof. Now, as the name 918 Spider implies, in car parlance, Spider generally means convertible, probably two-seat convertible, and the 918 Spider is a convertible, though not in the sense of you push a button and the top goes down. Instead, you pay over a million dollars for a car and you have to remove the roof yourself. I am now going to attempt this process, although I've never done this before, so, well, here goes. Oh, and before I start, you have to remove the passenger side roof panel first because it fits over the one on the driver's side to make it watertight. So you start over here. Gah. Done. Now, if you want to stow those roof panels inside the car, you put them inside the front trunk where they have a special little way that they're stored, which ultimately robs all of your cargo space. Now, the trunk itself has a couple of interesting quirks. In order to open it, you can push a little button on the driver's side door or push a little button on the key fob and it unlatches itself, but it doesn't open. You can't open it from here. Instead, you have to put your hand under here, feel around, use the latch, and then you can open it right up. You'll find when the roof panels aren't stored in here that the trunk is actually pretty big, at least for a supercar. Now, the most interesting thing inside the 918 Spider's trunk is undoubtedly this thing. It looks like a little piece of carbon fiber the size of the interior rearview mirror. When the roof is off, you're supposed to remove this little piece of cloth, take out this little piece of carbon fiber, and stick it on top of the windshield in a little slot where it has a home so that it can deflect wind. It's a carbon fiber wind deflector that you install yourself when the roof is off. I've never seen that before. I've never heard of that before. It's bizarre. And you will only find out about this thing in this 918 Spider review. Now, when it comes time to close the trunk, the process is pretty simple, though maybe not what you'd expect for a million bucks. You shut it, and then you push here and push here, and the trunk is closed. Now, speaking of interesting carbon fiber pieces, like the one I just stuck in the windshield, my favorite one is this. This is a duct, and it could just be a duct, but Porsche has decided to stick some carbon fiber on it. Because when you're charging a million dollars, you can stick carbon fiber wherever the hell you want. Now, the reason this car has that little carbon fiber strip next to that duct, the reason this car has a lot of additional carbon fiber over the standard 918, is that this one has the optional Visoc package, which was a performance package that was optional from new. It was named after Weissach, which is a city in Germany, the headquarters of Porsche's research and development. Now, the Weissach package wasn't cheap. It was $85,000, meaning if you chose a regular 918 plus the package, you were already in the $950,000 range before you added any other options. It included a lot of benefits, but the main one was that it lost 88 pounds of curb weight to make the car a little bit lighter. That's right, 88 pounds for $85,000, or about $1,000 per pound of weight loss. There were a couple of other benefits too, including the canards behind the rear wheels for aerodynamics, the rear diffuser, there are door loops inside the interior instead of regular door handles, and then there's my personal favorite, and that would be the racing harness. Now, Porsche is not allowed to sell a car from the factory with a racing harness in the United States, because then it would be a race car, according to the government. So instead, they sell you the 918, and they give you the racing harness for free, and you can do whatever you want with it, including have your Porsche dealer install it two seconds after you sign the papers. This car has the racing harness in the driver's seat in case the owner ever decides to take it on the track. Now, beyond the interior and the exterior of the Visoc package, there are a couple of other interesting quirks of the 918 that I think are worthy of mentioning. For example, this car runs a quarter mile in 9.8 seconds. Yes, that's right, this car runs stock nines. If you've ever paid attention to quarter mile times, you'd be blown away by that. Think about it this way, this car is closer in its quarter mile time to a top fuel dragster than a Camry, which is insane. Here's another insane thing. When this car was new, it had a liquid metal paint option that was $65,000. A new engine in this car is $265,000. And since we're talking about money, we might as well mention that this car, being a plug-in hybrid, partially electric vehicle, it qualifies for a federal tax rebate of $3,667, just like a Volt or a Leaf or a Tesla. 
So when you buy one of these, you can take a credit on your income taxes because <laughs> you're saving the planet. Now, lest you go and say that that is absolutely ridiculous, keep something in mind. When this car is in electric or hybrid mode, it has a lower emissions profile than a Toyota Prius. Now, before I get the 918 out on the road, I think we all agree I have to do one thing, and that is see what it sounds like when it starts up. And don't worry, it's not cold. I've been warming it up. Here goes. <laughs> Okay, so those are all the quirks and features of the 918 Spider. And before I get behind the wheel, a little story that you might find interesting. Now, back when this car came out, I worked for Porsche Corporate in a boring little office job. Nothing exciting, but the fun part of my job was I handled all the orders for the 918 Spider. If you wanted a 918 Spider, you gave a deposit to your dealership, and then your dealership contacted me, and I worked with Germany to get the allocation for the dealer for that 918 Spider. For every 918 Spider, including this one. Now, back then, I sat in a cubicle all day, and I worked with Microsoft Excel, and I drove a string of crappy used cars, and I never thought I would ever get the chance to actually drive one. But I was wrong, because now I'm driving the 918 Spider. First impression, the car is really, really quick. And I don't just mean fast, I mean the shifts are quick, the handling is tight, the steering, oh, oh, it's so incredibly precise. Transmission shifts are incredibly fast, amazingly so. That rear window is really small. <laughs> I can't see anything out there. Going over train tracks now. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> well, that's fast. <laughs> oh my God, this thing is insane. And the really cool thing is, when I floor it, I can hear a little bit of that electric motor. Like you used to be able to hear turbochargers, and actually it sounds really cool. <laughs> it's just so wildly fast. Like nothing I've ever driven before. So I'm sitting here in a stoplight now, and uh, there are a couple things I notice. In a lot of cars, in a Huracan, you just kind of can relax and chill, and, and it's fine. Uh, in this car, though, it's, it's shaking and vibrating. It definitely feels like more of a serious car. <laughs> guy in a Saturn just flipped out. When you're getting people in Saturns, that's when you know you've got a cool car. I'm also surprised at how reasonable it is. It does feel louder than a normal car. There's no doubt about that. But it doesn't feel tremendously uncomfortable or difficult. Getting in and out is a bit of a challenge, but it, it's not really that hard to operate, which is impressive to me. It, it's like a supercar that's a Porsche. If you fit in the seats, I feel like you could kind of cruise in this thing. Uh, I got the AC on, I feel comfortable. The ride is harsh. When you come to a complete stop, you can feel a little shuddering at probably the electric motor doing something. One big complaint I have, and I noticed it the second I got in this car this morning, you know, there's like four screens, but the main one, the one right here next to your, your, you know, your, your line of sight with the, the, the touch screen, really, it washes out in sunlight because it's basically pointing up. The benefit of, of its positioning is that it's near you, right next to the steering wheel. The problem is it's pointing upwards and the windshield comes so far back that it washes out this screen. How is this a car? That is crazy. That is so crazily crazy. Uh, I've driven a lot of cars, none this fast, and you can tell instantly. I mean, R8 V10 Plus was the fastest car I drove before this, and that was a fast car. And this feels much faster. The sound is good. The owner has told me that I need to take the roof off to really get, get the sound, so I'm gonna do that in a minute. But the sound is really good. You don't lose anything by, oh, it's only an electric car. Don't worry about that. All right, now I got the roof off, and I gotta say, I can already tell it's better. Now, a lot of people say, well, a supercar, it's gotta be rigid. It can't have a removable roof. Well, come on, I mean, at the racetrack, you're really gonna feel the difference between X rigidity and X minus one rigidity. It's ridiculous, but you do feel the difference driving down the road with the roof off. I gotta keep the windows up for sound purposes, but I tell you, with the roof off in this car, it is just a total joy. It's everything you could want. You got the incredible speed and the incredible handling and the technology and everything that makes this car cool. But now, I can see the sky. Oh. 
not only is it monstrously fast, but now I can hear, I can hear that glorious motor because the exhaust is right there and it sounds so good. I often talk about how I wish I like cars that are less powerful, that you really have to ring out to enjoy. Well, sitting here today driving this thing, <laughs> I'm not sure if I agree with myself. Few cars in this world sound better, I suspect, than this one. I've driven cars that have better exhaust notes like the LFA, but with the top off, you just, it's right there. I mean, it's so great. I don't think I've ever had so much fun. And I thought I'd be so nervous about the value when I was in the F40. It seems so fragile in comparison. This just feels like a Porsche on steroids. A lot of steroids. You know, it's funny because I drive my AMG station wagon. It's my daily car and I drive that a lot. That's nothing compared to this. And that is 520 horsepower. That's a fast car. Feels like a Camry. I'm serious. Suddenly I know why that left gauge screen is devoted entirely to the speed limiter function. <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe this. But this car is so drivable, even as an ultra car. I feel like I can have fun with it. I can throw it around and I can really enjoy it. I honestly thought all these electric supercars were kind of weenie cars. Oh, they're doing electric, oh, it's so stupid. Give me a big V12. That's wrong. This car is amazing and the electric component only benefits it. An amazing car. The best all around sports car, supercar, etc., that I've ever driven in my entire life. And I'm happy to say, I was able to spend the entire day with it. The owner tossed me the keys, he was busy. And I really got to learn the car and experience it. And I'm confident in saying that. It is the best I've ever driven. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I've just spent the day with the Porsche 918 Spyder. It was, from a lot of perspectives, the most incredible, amazing car I've ever driven. The most expensive, the fastest, the quickest, one of the most technologically advanced that I've ever reviewed. Now, is it worth $1.7 million? I can just hear you people angrily typing away, no, it's not worth that. I could have 2350Zs for that money, or oh, no way, I could modify a Camaro so that it's faster in the quarter mile. Fine, but if you're worth $100 million and you don't want 2350Zs or a modded Camaro, and instead you want the best, the coolest, the most amazing, the most advanced, the most exclusive, this is that. And now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I may take some heat for this, but while I've always found the 918 Spider cool looking, I don't think it's really beautiful. It's nice, it's functional, but it doesn't quite capture my imagination like some cars, and it gets an 8 out of 10. But its scores improve from there. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 2.4 seconds, which gives it a 10 out of 10. Handling, it's truly one of the best I've ever driven, maybe the very best, up there with only the new 4 GT, and it gets a 10 out of 10. Cool factor, come on, only a few cars in history are cooler, and it gets a 10 out of 10. And importance measures significance, one of the fastest, most expensive cars in the market, among the first plug-in electric supercars, the best that Porsche could do, the culmination of decades of engineering, it once again gets a 10 out of 10. That brings the total weekend score to 48 out of 50, tying the all-time leader, the Porsche Carrera GT. So we move on to the daily categories, starting with features. The 918 is well equipped with a lot of cool stuff, but it's missing some of the latest gadgets like lane keep assist and automatic steering. Obviously, I wouldn't expect a supercar to have that stuff, but this category measures all cars against all other cars, and the most advanced cars do have those features, so it falls a little short with a seven out of 10. Next up is comfort. The 918 Spider is rough over bumps and the seats are tight. It's not horrendously uncomfortable, but it's getting there, and it earns a three out of 10. Next up is quality, which measures materials and reliability, and the 918 is top notch with excellent materials that are up to typical Porsche quality. The only issues are the slow to respond touchscreen and, well, the obvious issue of the long-term dependability of an 887 horsepower plug-in hybrid supercar with four drive wheels, two electric motors, and a gas engine. Still, it gets an eight out of 10. Next up is practicality, which is a measure of cargo volume. The 918 Spider's 3.7 cubic feet should give it a two out of 10, and normally the gas Gas mileage would help its case, but this car is hard to enter and exit, the visibility is mediocre, and if you put down the roof, that cargo volume drops to literally zero. And then there's the question of being able to practically go anywhere in a car that's worth $1.7 million, so I have to give it a 1 out of 10. Finally, value, and this is the hard one. This car cost just over $1 million new, and it's easily worth $1.7 million today, especially with the Weissach package, but is it worth it? It's impossible for any regular person to judge, but I will say that a 70% 
percent value increase in two years suggests we may be in a bit of a bubble and I'm not really sure it's sustainable. It gets a six out of 10, but this category is the toughest of them all. Add it together and the total daily score is 25 out of 50, marking the very first time the Pontiac Aztec has ever beaten the 918 Spider in anything, ever. Anyway, if you've been adding up the scores along the way, you already know the total Doug score is 73 out of 100, which means the 918 Spider beats out the previous champion, the Carrera GT, by one point, and it now holds the highest Doug score of them all. I guess I need to find someone with a McLaren P1 or a LaFerrari to see if I can dethrone the new king.